So good afternoon again. So we will start now. So we are on time because I know some people have uh, trains uh, to catch at the end of the afternoon. Uh, so thank you very much for being here with us this afternoon. I hope the jet lag is not too too tough on you. I hope that uh, you you had a nice nice lunch uh, and you're not getting too too sleepy. Uh, we we will try to uh, to get you uh, uh, wake up uh, this afternoon with a very important topic. Uh, life-saving sensors, uh, but not the same one as this morning, which were for road safety, but the life-saving sensors that are being deployed for water monitoring. Uh, because pollution is a big issue uh, for us, a uh, big issue for the people that need clean water to sell their products. And so this afternoon, we will welcome uh, three different speakers with three different point of views uh, on what we need to do uh, to, uh, to have a better water monitoring and save uh, lives. So we will first welcome Catherine Driano uh, from IFREMER, uh, the National Institute uh, for Ocean uh, Science. And then we will welcome uh, Thomas Alaba from CLAT. Thank you. And we will then uh, have the pleasure to hear Sandra Lagozer uh, from Microbia uh, Environment, uh, which is a, a French startup uh, developing sensors uh, for this purpose of water monitoring. And at the end, we will have a session, a panel session, uh, with the three of them, plus a guest, uh, a special guest, uh, to discuss this really hot topic. So let's start with Catherine, Catherine Drano from IFREMER. She will uh, explain us uh, how water monitoring is managed today and what we need to do for the future. So Catherine, the floor is yours. So good afternoon, so everybody. So thank you for inviting me for this uh, nice uh, workshop and, and conference. So today I will talk about uh, uh, the technology we develop for the ocean monitoring and also for the observation. So I'm not sure that everyone knows uh, IFREMER, so this is a French institute dedicated to marine sciences and research. And so I will uh, give you a brief uh, overview of, of it. So IFREMER is a French national marine research institute and uh, its mission are quite uh, diverse. And uh, among them, so we study uh, the marine ecosystem and the condition for the sustainable exploitation, and this is very important. And we also observe uh, the functioning of coastal ecosystem and the physical ocean at various special scales, you know, with the, and, uh, with, with the big creation of the climate change. And we explore also the deep sea ecosystem, and it's quite challenging. And also because we are an EPIC institute, so we encourage the economic development of the marine activities. As you may know, France has the second most large marine area just beyond the United States. So usually we, we forget that. And uh, so this, this is why in France so is so uh, attached or concerned by the oceans and why the maritime economy is so important. So in order to, um, to realize this mission, so if Romer has a very, uh, has, a, um, has a quite uh, a number of stations along the, the coastal, uh, along the coast, sorry, in, uh, in the three, um, in, uh, in the Atlantic the and the Pacific and the I Indian Oceans. So we have also some stations on the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, since uh, 2018, um, the Ephraimer also is operating uh, the, what we call the FOF, is the French uh, Oceanographic Fleets, uh, for, the, um, for the benefit for the, the whole, I mean, scientific communities. And uh, so it's composed of different types of vessels. So we have a, a coastal vessel, seagoing vessel, and also underwater vehicles, and uh, such as, for example, the nautil. So you may know, I mean, this yellow uh, submarine. So 
The technology allows us to access, to explore, to understand, and to take care about the marine ecosystem. So, but we need new tools and sensors for efficient environmental monitoring, but for which parameters and which purpose? I mean, the specificity I mean, of the marine instrument will depend on this question. So we can distinguish two types of systems, either the observation on the alert system, and I guess... Uh, you will have a talk later on the warning system. So, the strategy for observing are defined by national government and organization, research group, and non governmental organizations. So, they make recommendations and define what we call the essential ocean variables, so we would call this EOV, and they also will make some um, recommendations for instrument specification. So EOV can be distinguished in several categories, such as physical parameters, so you can find in fact temperature, salinity, current, and also biochemical parameters, oxygen, nutrients. And the last category, but uh, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it, it's some, I mean, we, we need a lot of parameters for these categories, is linked to the biology and the ecosystem. So another, Another point, in fact, is regarding the monitoring of coastal uh, water. In fact, the European uh, Union uh, imposed regulation to the member countries I mean, for the water quality, the sanitary monitoring of the shellfish, and ecological monitoring. And so the DCSMM, and what we call the Directive Cadre Strategy for the Milieu Marin, established a framework aimed to reach, in fact, what we call the pristine status, or at least a good environmental status for the marine environment. So in France, so we are organized in several networks. Uh, so in this network, so you can find some, uh, for example, Rock, Refi, Remi, Reben, and each network has its specificity and indicators to, uh, to follow. And so they are in charge of this regular mission. So if you want to have more information, so please visit the website uh, NLIT. Um, you can find this on the Ifremer website. But what are the specificity of the marine observation? What makes this ecosystem so particular? So first of all, like you know, so Ocean represents 71% of the surface of the planet, but we only knew, only know only 5%. So, so it's very few. But the difficulty, in fact, the main difficulty is really to access to the ocean and to be able to have the best and uh, the highest spatial res res resolution and coverage. So moreover, in this, um, I mean, in this ocean, so we have to take into account, I mean, the horizontal, but also the vertical scale. And the vertical scale is, is very important because at the, at the very depth level, so we can find life. And so if we want to understand, I mean, the functioning of the ecosystem, so we really need, I mean, to, to make some, uh, to, to sample uh, the ecosystem at the various depths. So another difficulty to understand this ecosystem is, in fact, to collect data over a long time, but at a high frequency. So for the coastal observation, so in France, we have a, um, a network uh, called Costa Chef. So and it's uh, you can uh, so it's a fixed you have some fixed platform along the coast, so the different coasts in, uh, in the metropolitan uh, area. And uh, so these fixed platforms are, are designed for each uh, location, for each specificity, and also for the job to be done. So they are, of course, I mean, equipped with uh, different types of sensors. But for the sensors, um, like uh, like I say, um, just few minutes, just few seconds ago, like the EOV, so they measure this EOV continuously at um, real time, and uh, so it's only it's uh, automated, and uh, this um, this network has been operated for a long time 
for, for a long time because we need to have a long time theory to be able to see, so for example, uh, the, um, the impact of the climate change. So, but what we have to realize for this kind of network, I mean, it's need to have a very high operational maintenance. And it's not an easy thing. Why we need this? Because, I mean, when we uh, put something in the water, uh, the surface will be, I mean, will be colonized by all the type of uh, different uh, organisms. And so we have to get uh, rid of it if we, want, if we want to have, I mean, uh, uh, good quality of data. So this network is very, uh, how do you say, um, is very quite costly in, uh, of course, in money, but also in human resources. And this is something I mean we have to to keep in mind. So what does the future needs to understand the marine environment? Environment. So we have to keep in mind that these ecosystems depend on a different process, on biological and chemical and physical processes that are, that are in constant interaction. To understand and to preserve the system, so we should take account, I mean, also the human uh, activities, because, I mean, the oceans are in, uh, under the increasing human pressure that may impact, I mean, the ocean, um, the ocean ecosystem. So we, we really need, I mean, to, to have a clear picture of what happened and uh, what we can do also to preserve, I mean, the ocean, to have a holistic or integrative approach and multidisciplinary approach. Moreover, if we want to understand, I mean, clearly what's happened, so we have to take account also the huge variety in time and space to understand each process. So that's why, in fact, we need to have uh, a multi-scale system. So, I mean, to, in fact, so we can use two approaches, I mean, to, to try to understand to that, to, to answer to that, is to taking the laboratory into the ocean, and the other one is to develop, I mean, smart uh, sampling devices, I mean, to, to have a, a, a better resolution. So now I will give you a brief overview about what we have done. I mean, and what technology are brought to the ocean. So the first idea, the first idea was, I mean, to bring the experimental, experimental lab, I mean, down into the sea. So for example, I mean, the Embari, I mean, has developed a respiratory mode I mean, a respiratory motor system. In fact, it, it is used to, uh, I mean, to to evaluate the physiology of the organism. So we will uh, um, determine the um, the basal and the basic uh, metabolism by uh, uh, measuring the, the the oxygen consumption. So on the uh, on the right, so this is one. This is a picture of one of the benthic chamber we have developed in the lab. So this system is for coastal, I mean, uh, for coastal ecosystem, and is uh, is a benthic chamber chamber equipped with a lot of different chemical sensors. It's fully automated, and we we can have also um, high frequency um, data. Another uh, example of lab instruments uh, which was adapted for the in-situ measurement is the Raman spectrometers. So we have developed uh, a, a prototype which is deployable by Eurov, and so it is used uh, for really um, high depths. I mean, to and uh, the purpose is to uh, analyze gases and solids. So. Um, and uh, what I wanted to say, I mean, we have uh, at the moment, we have a current uh, expectation and uh, a great interest for methane detection. And uh, we also um, uh, uh, adapt this system for, uh, for the detection of pollution. Uh, and, and the, this, this example was for the PEH, and the technology is based on CERS, I mean, to be able to improve, I mean, the sensitivity of the detection of this pollutant. 
Another, um, another equipment, so we, we develop also another optical sensor based on the SPR meter, so for surface plastic resonance. And this one, this system, I mean, was uh, dedicated to the detection and to the quantification of a toxal Tox toxin, uh, um, of the toxin made by uh, a diatom. Uh, so this is the domoic acid. And uh, the advantage of this system is the sensitivity and the specificity. This toxin is, uh, was recognized by the specific antibodies and the binding between the two uh, molecules, the toxin and the antibodies, was revealed by the SPR. So in contrast to other type of biosensors, so we don't need to have an additional amplification step of labeling uh, molecules, for example. So new system are uh, under development using this, uh, I mean this uh, same type of uh, technology, but for we move to the SPR imaging, and the idea is to, uh, to be able to multiplex the, an the analysis and to be able to uh, detect, I mean, on, in the same sample, several uh, molecules at once. So we have uh, two prototypes at the moment. So we are working on a prototype uh, to, uh, to be, I mean, based on um, ionic imprinted polymers for trace uh, analysis of metallic ions. Uh, this is uh, funded by, uh, by, uh, by the INR. And the other system is dedicated for toxin detection and is based on, the apt on specific aptamers and antibodies. And uh, is, uh, is done in, um, within the European project Jericho S3. So um, another system, another lab equipment brought under the sea is the flow cytometers. So and this system is uh, commercial. This is sold by uh, is sold by uh, McLean uh, uh, Company, and the, it's a great. I mean, it's a famous imaging flow cytobot, and it's fully automated and it's submersible, and um, is dedicated, in fact, uh, to uh, to the to the to the characterization and the identification of the phytoplankton communities. But I mean. This system is really, um, I mean, very powerful, and uh, I dream to, to, to have once, I mean, uh, at Ifremer. So, but nevertheless, we develop in our lab uh, an imaging system, I mean, dedicated to a zooplankton ident identification, so we call this zoocam. And so this system, uh, this system is not submersible. So, but um, is, uh, is currently uh, used on board for fish assessment studies. And uh, I mean, uh, they, I mean uh, the, the team in Ifremer asked uh, ask us to, to develop new prototypes because uh, I mean, it's very useful for, for them. So, but as you know, I mean, eDNA is becoming the golden standard to estimate the biodiversity. Uh, so this field is quite new, in fact, but it's growing very, I mean, uh, fastly, and uh, because it has a very great potential and uh, fantastic, I mean, uh, um, I mean, I'm really convinced that, that uh, we, we will be able to uh, to better understand the the, um, the ecosystem and the environment. So why, I mean, it's, I mean, I mean, why is why people want to use it? Because of course it's less invasive, it's cheaper, faster, robust, and also uh, it's a scalable approach to observe all the type of uh, organism from the microorganisms to mammals. So the M Barry. So it's a famous, you know, institute. I use this fantastic system called the ESP. So ESP is the Environmental Sample Processor. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic also robot. Um, and for the eDNA, I mean, what the ESP uh, can do is to collect the water, it lies the cells present uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this sample, and then preserve the sample for the lab analysis. So it seems quite simple to say that, but in fact, it's very complicated to, to achieve that, and it's, it's, it's really a real feat. But the next step, 
and I, ho and I hope it will not be only a dream step, we'll be able to do the whole workflow under the water. So it means DNA extraction, DNA amplification, DNA sequencing, and then the bioinformatic analysis. So, but I guess this is the first step, the first three steps, which are the most complicated, I mean, to, to do, I mean, uh, to do under the water. So, but let's move, in fact, also to, uh, uh, to the sampling and what we can do, in fact, to improve our sampling capacity. So, there is a lot of drone which has been developed by several companies. So, I just give uh, you a few examples of this. So, we can divide, in fact, this kind of drone by the uncrewed surface vehicle and the autonomous underwater vehicles. And uh, what I wanted to say is that at IFREMER, so we have a very long history and uh, expertise, I guess, for developing the Argo profilers. So this system makes vertical, I mean, profiles, I mean, there, I mean uh, and uh, a lot of uh, different cycles. So it's not very ecological friendly because, I mean, when the battery and when the... I mean, at, at once, I mean, at one time, I mean, the best will last and it will end up, you know, on, on, the, on the ocean floors. So we have some program to be able to, uh, I mean, to, to take them out and to not to, uh, to stop, I mean, to pollute uh, the ocean. So, but why not use animal as a mobile platform? And this is uh, a new concept uh, called the environmental biologics. And so I just show you uh, two examples of, uh, of projects we have in Ifremer. So it's one on turtle and one is uh, using uh, tuna. And uh, so um, the technology and the sensor which can be used, in fact, on these animals are I mean, basic CTDs, camera, fluorometers, oxygen sensors, and also a consonder. I mean, all these uh, uh, devices, in fact, uh, measure I mean, the, the basic EOV. But of course, I mean, the biggest problem are currently the size of this electronic system. Because, of course, we want to use it to use this system on those smaller animals and not, you know, on the, on the big turtles or tuna. But, as you all know, humans are also animals. So why not exploit surfers, divers, fishermen, and uh, also sailors? So we have a lot of projects with, uh, I mean, with fishermen and also with sailors, and we have two projects with surfers also because they are really concerned by the, by the ocean issue. And uh, but for that, I mean, uh, I mean to, uh, I mean to involve the citizen. I mean for the science, we really need to have low cost, robust, and easy to use sensors, and this is uh, really important. So if we look into the future, so I mean this is like a Christmas list, I will say. We will be very happy, I mean, to have new sensors for new parameters, like I say for eDNA, but for also microplastic, because it's a big issue, in fact. And we need, in fact, to understand the distribution of this uh, new pollutant. We also need to have a low cost and high automatization to support expensive coverage. We need to have technology working in combination, and that is not I mean, so easy sometimes. And also to take advantage of the recent advances in artificial intelligence, I mean, to reduce human intervention from the data analysis. To use also sustainable material for new technology to avoid to polluted oceans, because I mean this was not really a concern. I mean the long, I mean the last uh, the last century for us. But now it's a it's a concern. I mean everybody is concerned by that. We have also, and this is always. I mean when we when we have to do. Uh, um, a platform or, I mean, a, a multi, um, uh, equipped with, with, a multi, uh, with different types of sensors, I mean, the creation of the engine, engineer is always what is the energy consumption? So we really need to improve, I mean, the power sources. And also, of course, 
I mean to, to have the smallest sensors and the smallest platform of sensors as possible. But, I mean, uh, fortunately for us, I mean, the technology is evolving rapidly with promising new development outside our field. I mean, outside our field, outside my field of, uh, of oceanography. So I know in CEA, so we work, uh, I mean, we are much more in advance that, that uh, I mean, in the environmental field. So I'm sure so that we could take advantage of your new developments. So thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you very much, Catherine. Yeah, your, your Christmas list is just perfect. Uh, we didn't check the slides before, but it, it, we are taking all the boxes, so it's great. So, and you're, you're right, we, we might know work for oceanography, but what we do in general is improving the technologies to match all those uh, requirements. So you, you, I hope you will benefit from it. So thank you, thank you very much. So now we will welcome uh, someone from our team of CLETI. Uh, that will tell you what we do in that field of water monitoring. So thank you very much, Thomas, for being with us. Uh, so I will let this mic for you and this one, this Catherine one. So thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ilona. Thank you very much, Catherine. Your presentation was uh, amazing. And uh, I don't know if we are Santa Claus, but we, we can try to do a few things to make that list become a reality. But definitely for us, it set the roadmap for the next 10 years. So thank you for solving a lot of our own work. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I am Thomas Alava. I am a bio biological sensor specialist. And I've been developing biological sensor in the lab for the last 10 years. And um, I realized that few of those researchers actually made it all the way to the ocean. And so I am, uh, Eleanor gave me the opportunity to give you my, get, my guidelines, if uh, one may say so, and uh, what pitfall to avoid uh, for the development of biosensors in the case study of littoral water sensor, which now I know that you, I should have said coastal water sensors. So uh, first of all, I, I will start with a few generality to give each, each and every one of you a few element of context. So, in order to link that um, workshop to the, the topic that is more than more workshop, what can we do outside beyond the Marlow? So in my recollection, and that's my personal view, like it engages nobody, but to me, more words is two-dimensional. Transistors, capacitors as are, are made mostly, have, have been made mostly using 2D microfabrication technology. Like you say, so flat, more. But uh, as soon as we reach the third dimension, we start etching silicon all the way down with uh, reactive ion etching processes. We, we have been able to make a much more complex object and also micro and nano system that, that tell me that definitely more than most like in the third dimension and biological sensor do fall in that category. So there are 3D microfabricated objects. So, what is a biosensor? I need to give you a few definitions. So uh, a biosensor is first and foremost, like a sensor in general, is a transducer. So transducer came from the Lat Latin word transducere, which means drive beyond, transform from one domain to another. And a transducer is indeed a device that converts one uh, physical quantity into another. So for example, the solar panel that you see in the screen is definitely a transducer. It changes the sun inclination to a position on the clock. Same is the thermometer. It changes the uh, augmentation in temperature into a dilatation of a liquid that indicates you a temperature. So that's a transducer, and a sensor is mostly a transducer. So um, I felt I... Well, let me give you... So what, what, what could be a, a transducer for sensing biological objects? Well, I'm gonna, there, is a, there is a lot of examples of transducers that we can use for doing biological sensing, but I'm going to give you one of those examples, which is microgravimetry. So microgravimetry is the way we have uh, been able to reduce the size of a scale from weighing entire person to weighing only small individual biological objects. So in microgravimetry, we use um, a, a resonating objects. So in the screen, you can see a cantilever, which move much like diving board at the local swimming pool. 
And so we put those structures in resonance. They vibrate at the resonance frequency. And the resonance frequency of those structures is connected to the mass of that structure. So now, if we uh, spit on that cantilever a few bacteria, well, the mass of that cantilever is going to increase, and the resonance frequency is going to decrease of a value that is proportional to the mass that was deposited. So now you see how a transducer, or so our microtransducer, can help uh, interacting with biological objects. But the question we have to ask ourselves now is, if uh, a bacteria that is uh, non-pathogenic, but that is of the same mass of the bacteria we want to detect fall on that st structure, or if uh, dust that weigh the same mass than the bacteria fall on that structure, will we be able to do biosensing? No, because we will sense the same mass no matter if it's a pathogenic bacteria, a dust, a gold nanoparticle. So it's important to add something to a transducer to make it a biosensor. And so a biosensor is a transducer that is augmented with biological molecules that can specifically attach one particular analyte in solution and not attach all of the other that we don't want to detect. So do you have here the scheme of a biological sensor? And so you can see that a biological sensor is the addition of two things, an, an addition of something synthetic made in the clean room to something living, a bioreceptor, uh, usually antibody or aptamers, that we attach to the sensor. So I don't want to be exhaustive because like, we, have we are developing many combinations of transducer and biological recognition molecule in Leti, but maybe to give you one example, uh, what we have that is most sensitive as a transducer right now is these optic optomechanical disc. So these are discs that resonate with a motion that is entirely in plane. So when it um, moves in liquid, it exchanges very little energy by dissipation with the surrounded fluid. So we have a very, very ener uh, efficient, uh, energetically efficient vibration, which means that we are able to follow the mass that lands on that object with extreme precision. And so you can see all the so does that, that system basically have a mass resolution that range from the picogram to the atogram range. And, um, and it's perf the perfect analytical platform for precision medicine or trace pollutant detection. And in the curve that is on the left and on your right, left and on your screen, you can see how we add biological molecule to that transducer in order to make it a biosensor. And so you can see the resonance frequency that decrease with the addition of the biological recognition molecule, effectively changing that transducer into a biosensor. So, you know, before starting, so while the situation where sanitary safety and environmental protection demand on-field rapid biological sensors, the number of those situations is currently increasing and it will continue of increases with the global warming. The more uh, hot the water becomes, the more the microbial risks become, uh, become uh, real. And on the other side, micro nanotechnology has demonstrated numerous miniaturized point of care and highly sensitive biosensing solutions. So this, this, so I, I could tell you a very, very nice story, like a, a princess story, where we have fulfilled all the need of the of the of the field with the beautiful sensor that we have made in Leti. But actually, my presentation is called "Pitfall to Avoid," so it means that it's not an easy task to perform. And so we're going to see why it's not an easy task to perform. And actually, let's face the reality: when biological sensors are required on the field for example, during the COVID pandemics, or during a crisis event, or for example, for, uh, for overwatching the microbial contamination for our basing water. Well, in all those situations, being in crisis moment or for perennial needs, uh, it's very, very little cases in which the solution from the micro and nano world have helped alleviate the surveillance task. So we need to understand why is that, uh, what, what, how did that happen? So, first of all, we have to understand that a, a biosensor is a little more, compli more complex than what I show you in that screen. So, obviously, the analyte has to come into contact with the sensor, but we need to make sure that the, the analyte doesn't fly far away from the sensor. We cannot just uh, put a sensor into a swimming pool and hoping that one bacteria will come landing on our sensor. So, we need to force the fluid to 
pass close to the sensor in order to ensure the, 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 the chances of capture. So we need more, more than often microfluidic addressing close to the sensor at the chip level. So another thing that we need is that usually those transducers are electric, right? So we need to gather the electrical signal. But we just put the transducer in contact with the salty water, because most of the water or, uh, or in, in the environment are salty, especially coastal water. So salt and electricity do not like being together. So we need to be able to package the electrical signal within our transducer in a very smart way that do not interact with the microfluidic addressing. And, and lastly, we need to graph the functional, the functional bio-recognition molecule and we need to maintain their viability throughout the entire operation of the sensor. And maybe you know that antibodies do not like being placed in very harsh environment and do not like to overcome uh, very large temperature change. So the, gra the process for packaging and grafting the biological, biological recognition molecule need to be compatible with all of the other processes. So that's already a problem that's becoming more and more complex. If I add to that, more, more than often, we have to perform sample preparation before putting it into the, the, the final analysis. So now you see that just a single functionalized silicon chip is far from being a real operable biosensor. So this is why I want to give some uh, insight into. And so I do think that uh, one difficulty that we have to realize is that from simple transducer that I used to make a sensor in the physical world, in the real world, such like accelerometer that will sense an acceleration and to change it into an electrical signal, it, most of the difficulty came from making the chip itself. Once the chip has been made in the, micro, in, the, in, the, in the clean room, it's actually quite a few steps to ramp up from that chip to an actual demonstrator, an actual final system. Like for an accelerometer that will be putting that onto a, a printed circuit board with components, uh, having a display, closing that in a box, and then you have a demonstrator of your accelerometer chip. But when it came to making sensors that operate in liquid environment for sensing biological objects, that process is much more complex. You have to fabricate your chip, obviously, same, same thing, but then you have to perform all of the steps that I was explaining um, and in order to reach to that final system. So all of those steps are quite long that if we simply wait that we have finished to build the chip to start working on the system, it's basically going to take us more than five to six years for every different application. So it's way too long to, to respond to the actual industrial needs on the, on the, on the, on the field. So, um, but so before I start going to the next of the presentation, I, wa I wanted to uh, emphasize on the fact that we, are, we do fabricate chips here at Leti, but we do not sell those chips. More, more than often, we do sell system. Just like imagine somebody that would like to buy a phone, and somebody will tell them, well, yeah, I do have a perfect um, 4G modem chip and a perfect 4G modem camera. But they will say like, yeah, but that, that's not what I want to use them, right? So it's ki it will be kind of silly. So the the system that around the chip is actually not um, it's not facultative. It's mandatory to build that if you want to transfer all that we made here uh, into the real world. So. In the, yeah, that, that's my, my point. In the pursuit of on-field operability for micro and nanobiological sensor, the system is out of far more importance. So, um, so, the, so the first pitfall would be uh, not putting the system first, not put, saying that for biological sensor, the system has to be the key center of your project. But uh, there is more than, than there is more aspect to understand is. Um, where that system is going to be operated. So, for example, in which regulatory framework that do we need to make the measurement? What target are we looking for? What is the environment that target is embedded into? It is, is it like a river? Is it a river in the winter, in the summer? Is it coastal water, very saline, not saline? So all of those conditions do matter. And are there some contaminants in the environment that will make our measurement false. That's very also important to, to take into account. And finally, who will perform the measurement? If it's myself, I'm perfectly well able to operate a MEMS even on the, on the, on the, on the, on the beach. But if it's a technician that, is just, that doesn't know anything about MEMS and operation, we need to make the system easy enough to operate for the people that at the end are going to make the measurement. So the second pitfall would be, and will be not to take into account where the system will operate. So, syncing the system without the field of application. 
So that leads me to starting my presentation, so pitfall to avoid for the development of biosensor and the case study of littoral water sensor. And what actually I want to do is brief you to the project that I am uh, r running right now, which is the Novel Exosome Observer Project, a project in which we have tried to team with uh, the communi community agglomeration of, from the Basque country, that is actually a, a very large um, town association in order to be the closer possible from the actual uh, operational need in the field in order to start our, our measurement process. So that, process, that project is uh, as the ambition of changing the way we analyze microbial pollution in basin water from what is currently today, which is sampling on the field, uh, refrigerated transport and PCR in the lab to what it could be tomorrow, which, which, which is a drone that will carry a system that can make all those measurements on field. So, in that project, in order to avoid the pitfall number two, which is uh, not integrating the final operation uh, of the sensor, we have tried to integrate the final economic actor from the startup of the project by teaming with the, uh, the town from Pays Basque. So it's like more than 158 towns and big touristic cities just like Biarritz, saint jean de luz and Bayonne. And so in that area, because in the summer there is much, much more population than in the winter, you have a lot of um, days where the beach has to close due to bacterial coliform pollution events. So we teamed up with, the, with, those, uh, with those cities and uh, with the, the partner that they have to make the analysis on field, which is a startup, um, a company that is um, spun off from Suez. And so they help us choosing the final testing site and they help us uh, building what would be the desired demonstration in the end that will convince the city, the company, that this technique is good. So let me bring you to the final site that we have uh, elected, which is the, the Bay of saint jean de luz cibourg So it's a perfectly good example for what we want to do because the, in that bay, so it's a bay, so the water are not being rinsed by the sea very, very, very rapidly. And you have like more than 20,000 uh, 20, uh, inhabitants that live close to that bay. You got two rivers that drop into the bay and you got a lot of towns that um, 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 waste water go into that river. You got two weeks of feeding in that bay. And in the summer, you have more than 17 campsites that, that when they are filled, they make such that the population is three times the population in the winter. So obviously, the, the wastewater treatment facility are not designed for that increase in population. So when there is a thunderstorm, the wastewater uh, facilities just uh, over, yeah, like, uh, like spill out. And you end up having beaches that are contaminated with bacterial coliform. So we decided three uh, testing sites, one on the, the two be both beaches of that bay and one in the upstream river that feed that, that bay. And so we, we decided that during a single morning, we will have to perform two simultaneous biosensing measurements, targeting both bacteria that are looked by the, for, by the European norm at each three testing sites. So basically, we need to board on that, uh, on that, on that um, automated drone a system that will perform those six measurements. So which sensor can we use to perform that job on the field? So first of all, what do say the European regulation norm? So it gives, it studies three criteria, two are bacteria and one is an algae, cyanobacteria and E. coli and enterococcus. And so basically the norms say that from, uh, with regard to the concentration of those bacteria you have in the, in the liquid, you will be in a criterion that is either good, medium, or, or bad. So there are some, some sensors, some transducers that we can buy from the, from the, that are available in the, in the market that we can functionalize to make a biosensor. For example, SPR, like uh, Catherine Reno mentioned. Um, so, so, but the problem is that those commercial sensors are not sensitive enough for what we want to do. The, like the quartz crystal covalence, also SPRI, will not be enough to reach the low level of concentration that we need to be able to sense if we want to make something useful from the norm point of view. So, even though we're going we're gonna to be doing pre-concentration of the sample to increase that, co that concentration, we we'll still will need to use some, micro, some sensor um, coming from the micro and the nanotechnology industry, such as, for example, photonic microsensor that we develop at LT, 
uh, or microgravimetric sensor such as the type that I showed you in the first uh, in the first slide that will have the, uh, the dynamic range and uh, load detection mass that could be useful from that norm. All right, but so those sensors are still developed in Leti. They are they are getting higher in the technological readiness level scale, but they are not that they are not ready yet to be embedded on the field. We still need a few year, uh, year and a half of development. So what are we going to do? Are we going to wait that the, sen the, the sensor specialists have finished everything that they wanted to do before st building the system that's going to bring the sensor on the field? Well, we don't want to do that because that will be wasting a lot of time. So in order to avoid pitfall one, we'll, we say that the system is going to be the hardest part to develop, so we need to work on that since the beginning. So what we do is that we split the development of the sensor to the development of the system to make them run in parallel. So we will start building the system from the beginning, even though we need the sensor are not ready and we need to validate a few functions with pH sensor or commercial sensors that are not, do not have the performance we want but are, are available. And when the microsensors are ready, the system will be able to accommodate them for rapid on-field testing. So what system do we have to do to make such a uh, strategy in parallel working? So we propose to build a system that will uh, build around a passive sensor motherboard with socket in which we can uh, load interchangeable cassettes that will allow to multiplex measurements and to reconfigure measurement from one measurement session to another. So obviously on the system there's going to be some more uh, parameters like some pumps, uh, biological reactive if you want to rinse the sensor to perform a new measurement. Uh, and but, but mostly that, that central part, the central concept is, it lies here, is that I myself, system engineer, I can build the system uh, entirely not knowing what's going to be in those cassettes and the sensor specialist, they can concentrate on their sensor not knowing what the, 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 the Function, the function of the system precisely is. So this allows both the system and the sensor to be developed in parallel and still be operable at the end. So now that I've told you the solution to make those strategy work in parallel, let me give you a few de more details about what's going to be in that system. So obviously you see that the boat, the uh, automated boat, is not part of the system, it's just the carrier of that system. So that system could be carried also as a standalone. And basically what we're going to um, have is go we're going to have three steps. First, we're going to send the, the water into a sample preparation stage based on the technology of filtration and pre-concentration that is actually currently commer commercialized from by a startup that is uh, spun off from CEA, uh, which is direct analysis. And so in that, um, in that chip, basically we are able to trap all of the bacteria from the, from the, um, from the sample uh, against a filter. And if we revert the flow to that filter, we can gather all the bacteria into a much smaller sample than what we had in the beginning. So right now we know that we can uh, pass 100 millimeter of clean water and gather, take all the bacteria that are in that 100 millimeter and have them back into a one millimeter sample. So it's almost a two-fold, two-order of magnitude increasing concentration. Then those, uh, this concentrated sample will be directed to uh, three different sensors. One is going to be a microgravimetric sensor, so sensing the bacteria as a wall from its mass. The second one will be a lab on chip that will lyse the bacteria and detect, detect them by performing a fast on chip uh, PCR reaction from the lamp type. And the last one will be an optical microbiosensor that will detect bacteria based on the attenuation of emitted light that happen on a, on a waveguide. So, the first sensor and the third sensor are sensors that need to be functionalized because they specifically uh, um, identify the bacteria as a wall. So obviously the, the antibody that we're going to put on the sensor are going to be of tremendous importance and we want to we wanna have the best specialist of immunology that will help us select it and benchmark those antibodies. So we, we, we work with the fundamental research division of CEA. So as you have seen in that system, I want to I want to emphasize on a few um, points. First is that we're not using. I've told you how deploying one sensor is already super hard. Well, here I'm placing three different sensors. So why is that? This is because 
after talking to the people that were working on field doing those measurements and that needed to um, automate the, 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 the um, to, um, to to use those measurements, basically I've uh, I've realized that the most important uh, specification they wanted to have was not the one I was initially um, thinking about. So the most important question that one has to ask yourself is what is at stake if my measurement is positive or if my measurement is negative? So in the case of basic water, it's really simple to understand. If the measurement is positive, the, 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 the town official or the city official need to close the beach. So for a touristic city like Biarritz, for example, one day of beach closure represents a million euro in, uh, in loss for the shop that they are in town. So the, the, the economic impact is huge. And what if, if the, the measurement is positive because my sensor said so, but actually the, the, the local agency for uh, water quality came and checked and they find something that my sensor did not find, then it's, uh, um, uh, the, the, the town official have put the life of the swimmer in danger. So they risk uh, administrative closure of the beach for five years. So you understand how the most important parameter for them was not the rapidity of the measurement, how much uh, you can let the boat in the sea. The most, the, the most important criterion was fiability of the measurement. So this is why we have uh, set, set three different sensors to detect the bacteria in three different ways, and we have set a very large, uh, we set a very high priority on selecting the proper antibody for the task. So, so that so that would be the third pitfall, which is neglecting fi fiability. So I'm close to, to the end of presenting to you that project, and I want to expand to that, uh, that application that is monitoring bacteria in basin water into saying that the philosophy of the, 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 the prototype we are building is much broader because, because it's reconfigurable and we can change the type of sensor we put in the system without changing the system. We actually see that system as a hub that will help accelerating biological sensor to be deployed on field. We have set, put three sensors in them, but why not putting other sensors that will be more adapt to another type of measurement? Uh, so, to conclude, let, let, let's uh, sum again the, those, those guidelines that uh, Eleanor asked me to, to give. So the first pitfall, we're not putting the system first. The biosensor is uh, before and foremost uh, an entire analysis system, not just a single silicon chip. Second will be not taking into account the specificity of the environment where the system will operate. Third, third part of all will be neglecting fiability of the measurement and uh, yeah, not, not, not investing into making sure that the sensor gives the same answer in the same situation. And finally, to conclude and to open the talk, I would like to say that the fourth pitfall will be not taking into account biofooling which, as Catherine say, is something that happens to everything that is placed in, the, in, in water. It will be colonized uh, very rapidly. So in my talk, I did not talk about that because um, already overcoming the three pitfalls was already complicated and the project was of large size but of certain size. So in order to avoid taking into account biofooling, I've decided to carry the system on a drone that I can gather at the end of every session and clean with fresh water in order to restart them from for, for tomorrow. So actually that leaves us with the question of maintenance of the system. And that's actually something we're gonna be talking, I think, after. Because um, obviously taking a sample onto the field, bringing it to the lab, bring some logistic. And having a system that will be here forever, it's perfect. But if you have to go and refill the sensor every day, what good does he, does he bring you? It still bring you a lot of logistic. So yeah, that will, that will be more my guideline. And so in order to conclude, I will say that biosensor development in the world is difficult and a dedicated system is essential to demonstrate the on-field operability and convince investors that it's a viable solution. But at the same time, instrumentation of open water with faster and autonomous biological assay is going to be crucial in the future. So I will conclude exactly the same than Catherine did saying that Leti know how to design, fabricate those silicon components, has ability to integrate its system for various different applications, know how to functionalize the sensor to put microfluidics. 
if Remer uh, know how to fight biofueling, know what it is to maintain systems that are as, at sea, to deploy sensors at sea and how complex it is, they, all, they get all of the knowledge of the ocean and of what is, uh, we can make out of the data. So I would strongly I would finish by strongly recommending like a global alliance for the deployment of biosensor that would make sh two large institutes such as Ifremer and Leti team up for tackling that, that highly important challenge. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Thomas. It was very clear, and uh, we can see now how uh, sensors coming out of more low <laughs> can help uh, uh, saving our waters. So now we will switch to um, a company, a young company, uh, that has made the step of uh, building and selling sensors in that field. So let me welcome Sandra Lagozer from Microbia Environment. Sandra is boosting this young company, and she will explain us what is the novel tool developed by Microbia. So Sandra, I will give you a new mic. There it is. It doesn't work? Oh, yes, ah, of course. Good. That's true. Sorry. But I need the... Yeah. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Very happy to be there and very honored to be there. I will thank you, uh, Eleanor and Thomas. Uh, it's a great honor. Um, so I'm Sandra Lagozer. As a, I'm a researcher at the, at the beginning, and I jumped into the business uh, world, uh, let's say by chance. <laughs> it was not my plan at the beginning, but two years ago, I decided uh, to work for Microbial Environment, so this French biotech company, because I found uh, the biosensors they developed was quite challenging, and I decided to, yeah, to, to bring my skills to, to give a chance to this company. So I will present you what we call genetic biosensors to detect cyanobacteria and microalgae, uh, and particularly interesting to forecast uh, their proliferation in water. So water, it's for all of us a big concern, and it's now in everyday conversation. We are speaking about scarcity of water, pollutions from diverse sources, chemicals, microplastics, and so many other. It's a big problem, but we always forget that water is also a living entity. And it's important to think about it, that in few milliliters of water, you can have hundreds thousands to millions of microorganisms. And some things that we, call, we can call the water microbiota, which, like the microbiota we have in our digestive tract, really drives all the reaction, making an ecosystem functioning well or turning bad. And like for us, for medical diagnosis, we need also a system for diagnose the water as a living entity. And among these microorganisms in surface water, where the light uh, can reach the water, we have photosynthetic microorganisms. And I will focus on them today. So first of all, first of all the cyanobacteria. Maybe you know them uh, also as uh, blue-green algae, but they are not algae, they are really bacteria. They are on Earth for 3.5 uh, billions here, uh, they provide us with the oxygen on Earth, so they made possible the expansion of, of life on Earth and the life uh, we know today. So they are very important, even if they are only bacteria. They are everywhere, in fresh water and seawater, in soils, in air. The other ones are the microalgae. Here we are more in the seawater, they don't live, uh, or very few of them, in fresh water. So we are here in uh, marine systems. Microalgae are much more bigger than cyanobacteria. They are eukaryotic cells. And they are very important because of their huge diversity, but also because they are the phytoplankton feeding all the rest of the trophic chain in oceans. So both of them are very important, fascinating, Cyanobacteria, for example, can create these beautiful landscapes, uh, as in Yellowstone parks. Maybe you have seen that in for real. It's just amazing. They colorate uh, the water uh, because it's sulfuric. It produces these amazing colors. 
microalgae in seawater can make also these beautiful luminescent blooms on the seaside. It's also something very beautiful. But they can also cause that. And that is dirty water, uh, water with a very bad uh, taste and odor, ugly, just something you don't want to go inside or to, to let your children or your dogs going inside. And they also cause that. And here it's even worse than just have bad taste and odor. It's about oxygen depletion and it's about toxins. They, or these organisms produce very, very strong, powerful toxins that can be uh, dangerous for uh, humans, but also for uh, uh, living uh, wildlife uh, organisms and, and so on. So, as a summary, okay, I say cyanobacteria and microalgae, they are the phytoplankton in freshwater, in seawater. They are essential, they are part of the aquatic microbiota, and they make the ecosystem functioning well. They are, they are problematic only once they proliferate. And it's a phenomenon that we call harmful algal blooms, or HAPs, uh, really common in the scientific community, we speak about HAPs. And uh, why? Why these apps occur? So here again, it's about climate change. It's about having um, water more and more warm, water stagnant, water which is stratified really strongly. And what is really um, triggering this uh, bloom very uh, suddenly, it's uh, the supply of uh, nutrients coming from agriculture, uh, wastewater treatment, etc., and particularly the phosphates are really problematic. And as I say, these apps show that something is wrong. It means the ecosystem is sick, something is wrong. And in addition, there is a problem with toxicity. So I let you imagine all the consequences for the biodiversity, for the public health. So as I say, not only humans, but also livestock, pets, etc., with huge consequences for economy and the society in general, because it affects in fresh water, the drinking water uh, supply chain, for example, which is quite important. Recreative activities, it's something else, but the drinking water is quite important. And in seawater, it's all the aquaculture uh, uh, area is affected by that. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's a big problem that maybe is not so uh, known, not so explain, uh, it's not so often that in the news we hear about that, it's still something people need to, to, to know about, to, to be educated on that problem. And whatever we are trying to do to fight this problem, so it could be uh, trying to control the release of uh, phosphates in particular, trying to clear blooms, so it's a very in a emergency situation, they are physical systems, ultrasonic systems, and algae sites uh, to really try to make something when it's too much, but it's not a solution, of course, it doesn't solve the problem. And there are also action much more uh, efficient, in my point of view, uh, with bioremediation bio and restoration of ecosystems, because as I say, these ecosystems are sick, we need to, to, to cure them, to make something. So trying to replant some, some trees, uh, to restore a good functioning by, for example, seeding some specific bacteria can be an answer. But whatever we do, we need a monitoring system, a monitoring program, and more, more, importantly, we need, more importantly, we need an early warning system to prevent, to protect people and avoid the, the, the very bad consequences I just speak about with some anticipation, because for now we just manage the risk, and we do nothing for anticipating this problem. So fortunately, in many countries, there are programs like with the IFOMER in France, and uh, in most of developed countries, there are programs in Asia, in Europe, in North America. And there is a panel of uh, quite interesting tools with different uh, resolution size and uh, technologies. So we start. Uh, First, from space, we can observe these apps from space. 
thanks to really, really powerful uh, satellite imaging, we can also uh, quantify, as I, it's, it's, it's shown on, on the graph, we can really quantify what is happening, but of course we need to go to the field. It's not enough to just have a look from space. So we have also uh, in-field sensors, really interesting, for example, this one, the RG torch, which is uh, like uh, a Star Wars uh, laser you put in the water, and you can have a measurement, a direct measurement of chlorophyll A and other specific pigments produced by cyanobacteria or microalgae. So it's a very powerful tool because it's in the field. Then you have microscopy, which is the gold standard. Of course, if you want to observe a proliferation of a microorganism, you need to have a look at it. It's very important, but it's a method which is very tedious, and we need experts for that. It takes time, it's costly, so we cannot just live with microscopy but it's a gold standard. And then you have a, a panel of uh, laboratory tools, more oriented for really measuring the toxins in water, so not about counting, detecting uh, the microorganisms, but looking at the, the toxins that they can produce. So you have molecular tools, like the qPCR that everybody knows now, uh, thanks to the COVID uh, pandemic. With qPCR, we are able to quantify uh, the expression of genes encoding the most important toxins, but not all of them. But this is still a QPCR, it's something quite uh, heavy uh, to perform, tedious. You have also a battery of immunoassays that indirectly measure a concentration of toxin in water. So you have still a uh, mice assay, really. We give a toxin, a water uh, contaminated with toxin to, to, to mice, and we see how much time it takes to, to make them die or something like that. Uh, you have also rapid tests, like for the COVID, uh, very interesting, but semi-quantitative. Uh, not always, uh, we don't have all the toxins, so it's not so, so easy. And also uh, ELISA-based assay, so like for the medical diagnosis, we try to use the same methods to measure uh, toxins. And you have also the direct uh, measurements of toxins based on the uh, traditional uh, chemistry methods, uh, like mass spectro spectrometry, for example. And now I will arrive to my genetic biosensors. Why are they different? Why are they something like intermediate in two all these tools I, I present to you just before. So they are different because they don't count the microorganisms, they don't uh, measure the toxicity directly, they are measuring the cellular activity. I will explain uh, just after. But these parameters enable us, enable us to follow the dynamics of blooms, of apps. And it's really important because as microorganisms, they are very dynamics. So my scheme is not uh, as beautiful as the one from Toma, but it's the same idea. What is a biosensor? A biosensor is a, a biological support, which can be of synthetic origin, that will recognize an analyte, and the interaction will be transduced into a signal that we can measure to quantify the, quant to quantify the target uh, analyte in the sample. When the analyte is not specific, it doesn't work. In our case, the support, the recognition uh, uh, um, sensor, is a sequence-specific aptamer, uh, oligonucleotide probe, so it's DNA simply, that will recognize ribosomal RNA, and this interaction will be uh, quantified through a colorimetric reaction. So maybe if you are not a biologist, we will ask, hey, what, what is this uh, ribosomal RNA? So ribosomal RNA, it's a, uh, an interesting molecule because it's a, nucleo a nucleic acid, so like DNA, uh, like messenger RNA that you know for the COVID. So it's a nucleic acid encoded by a genetic sequence. Then it's specific from a target, cyanobacteria, or microalgae that I want to detect. But this molecule is also interesting because it's constitutive of the ribosomes, and the ribosomes are 
subcellular uh, units, which are really the factories of the cells. They produce proteins and enzymes, all the material a cell needs to grow and to finally divide. And we are speaking about microorganisms. A cell which grows and divides will make a proliferation. So here you have a very sensitive proxy of cell activity that enables to detect only the living and dividing cells that, will, uh, that can uh, generate a bloom and then produce toxic metabolites. I like to, to show this scheme for the people who don't, don't, don't know maybe uh, how uh, uh, bacteria uh, grow when you put them in a petri dish, like we do in laboratory. When you put some bacteria in a petri dish, they have first a resting phase. Then they start using the resources, they grow until a plateau, until reaching a plateau. And then the population collapses because the resource uh, disappeared. There's nothing else to, to eat to continue growing. And it collapses and it's finished. We have to reseed the cells to another petri dish. And with apps, we can think about the same uh, dynamics, particularly for cyanobacteria in closed freshwater systems, maybe not exactly the same in open ocean, oceans, but in fresh water it's quite like this. And after a decline, as we are in a natural environment, you can have again a new bloom. There's no limitation. The resources can come again. For example, after a bigger, uh, a bigger storm, there's again some phosphates coming and then it will start again. From this, the, the uh, regulation, the, norm, the norms, put some thresholds to decide, to really to define when we say it's dangerous, when we have a bloom, and we know so these numbers, for example, are for cyanobacteria. When we are above uh, 100,000 cells per milliliter, we consider, okay, we are really in a very dangerous situation. That the frame where we have uh, the, the, the release of toxins and when the bloom declines, it's also very uh, bad because it's the moment where the, the toxins is, uh, are liberated. Most of them are intracellular, so when the cells uh, uh, are disrupted, it's the worst moment. So that's uh, very interesting to use this graph. And uh, all sensors are particularly interesting at three moments, in my point of view. So really at the beginning, that under the microscope, you still have some cells, okay, but it's hard to to say what's, uh, what will be uh, in the next days. But with our sensor, we detect this very sensitive signal from activity, and we, we already see that it will grow up. At the end of the bloom is the same. Under the microscope, you see a, okay, a lot of cells. Whatever they are dormant, uh, dying, or what is the same, you can't sell a lot of them. And we already uh, detect a loss of activity that we can anticipate the end of the crisis, the decline of the bloom. So that's really precious. Uh, and uh, same thing, the, the third uh, interesting uh, 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 thing is that to anticipate the occurrence of a new bloom. So now it was the theory. So as a summary, the platform we have developed for these biosensors. We know cyanobacteria, microalgae, that are problematic. They are not all problematic, but we know which ones are problematic because they are toxigenic, they are recurrent and produce seasonal blooms, but it's impossible to predict when the blooms will occur. So we developed that. And uh, so for one cyanobacteria or microalgae group, we search for genetic signature, a barcode to design the probes I showed you just before to capture ribosomal RNA. So this is a proxy of activity. And we cannot say just that to our hand uh, uh, um, consumers. We cannot say, oh, you have uh, 100 nanograms per liter of RNA. <laughs> no sense for them. So we translate this signal into uh, color-based uh, scales to give a, a, a risk class. Blue is OK, green it starts to be uh, yellow, vigilance, and then red and big red, it's an alert, you will have a bloom. And to transduce, uh, transduce this uh, signal, we use a really rapid and simple uh, colorimetric test. So we are not at the level of a micro sensor. Here you have a macro sensor. It's still a lab tool. You need to bring back your sample to the lab, but it's really fast. In less than three hours, 
we are able to give the results to the data and the recommendation to the end user. And as it's so easy and rapid to, to perform, we can do that at high frequency. Of course, if we can sample at this frequency, but if we, if we can, we can produce data uh, uh, at high frequency and we obtain a graph like this, where you really follow the dynamics. And when you have three points on, in time showing uh, a regular increase, we uh, emit uh, an alert. And uh, since uh, last year, our technology is available in a box. Uh, before, it was just a service from our laboratory, but last year we managed to create these kits. So its name is CARLA for Cellular Activity RNA-Based ELISA. And we have uh, a small catalog for now, but it's uh, the most uh, toxigenic uh, cyanobacteria and microalgae uh, known from the community. And we are yeah, right, quite pr proud of this. Uh, so to illustrate this, we, I will show you rapidly uh, uh, two case studies. So the first one is a lake um, really close to our lab, so we can produce a result uh, at, the, at the same day of sampling, so it's really uh, comfortable. So this lake is in the, the Pyrénées Oriental, close to Perpignan. Uh, maybe you know this area is uh, uh, very touristic, but uh, mostly known for the, the beaches at the seaside, and this lake is particularly interesting for tourists because it's fresh water, it's different from the seaside. It's one million of people uh, coming there uh, uh, every year, so it's important for the, 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 the area. Uh, this small lake, so it's, you need one hour by jogging to make the round, is interesting because you have in the north uh, basing area, then you have a big uh, reservoir where I put the Erison, what is Erison in English? I don't know. It's a bio <laughs> thank you. It's a biodiversity reserve. People are, are, are walking dogs. Uh, there is uh, uh, fishers and also a uh, caption for drinking water. So many use. And from the main uh, reservoir, there is a pumping system to the bathing uh, area. In 2017, there are big problems with cyanobacteria there. The, the, lake, the lake turned uh, really green, uh, fuel green. It was uh, very, <laughs> very terrible for, for the tourists. And then the, the community uh, decided to, to make something, and they asked us, because we are not so far, Microbia, can you do something? So we started to, to follow the activity, so it's a blue curve, and compare with microscopy, which are the yellow bars, in 2019. This year, it was only one bloom, okay. Apparently, it was uh, working good. We identified the cyanobacteria in, uh, causing these blooms, afanisomenon, whatever. The second year, we have a biggest bloom, and uh, last year, it was amazing. It was really doing much more. Uh, so we sample there uh, two times a week. So it's really precious for the managers. I know really in near real time what is happening. And that's the graph from uh, last summer, uh, with all the biosensors together, before it was only afanisomenon. So we see these dynamics, and at the really end, really, really last point, we detected the microcystis, which was really the first time we detected this cyanobacteria here. We found we made a, a mistake, but no, we controlled by microscopy. It was really uh, microcystis, so now we are starting again. The last week, it was the first uh, sampling for this year. We are very curious to see uh, what, what will happen there. And th there we work in coordination with the public health authority, the IRS, and the Department of uh, Pyrénées Orientales, and we really uh, managed to build a logis logistical decision tree with two uh, alert levels, so they really integrate our, our, our sensors in the norm and the official uh, uh, surveillance monitoring of, of this lake. So after three hours, as I say, we give the first alert with a blue, green, yellow, uh, red uh, uh, signal. If it's blue and green, okay, we continue sampling. Uh, if it's yellow and red, then we go for microscopy and toxins, which are the official conventional methods uh, for the monitoring. If, depending on the official threshold, we go for yellow or red, and we uh, put some uh, 
you know, shields around the lake. The police uh, go to explain people, to stop uh, fishers, etc. Uh, there is a, a real uh, coordination. It's a really a good achievement. And we apply the same with uh, water supply, uh, suppliers. So in France, uh, it's most of the time private companies like Suez, Veolia, or BRL. We are now in their catalog, so we are it's also a big achievement for us. But it's not something we can, com we can communicate, of course, because it's private companies. But they use this uh, logistical tree uh, just uh, with the first alert. Uh, when we give, we say uh, blue, green, yellow, red, they action things. For so, so example, water pumping, or they decide uh, which site we they should shut on, uh, switch off or switch on. Uh, they go to their filters, they adapt uh, their treatments. Of course, they have to do toxin measurements and so, but they really use our alert to prevent uh, things. Because for them, the most problematic thing is well, its toxicity, of course, but it's uh, the, the, the clogging of filters. When cyano blooms, it's horrible. You can have really uh, scums, uh, this really uh, uh, dense uh, population, and it can really destroy all the systems. So if they can know with two, three, four, five days, that it will happen, they, they, can, they can have action. That's really important. And then let's go to the sea to finish uh, with also an historical uh, customer, which is uh, um, shellfish farmers at the lagoon of Le Cat, so very close to us also, that enables to, to provide data results at, uh, the day after the sampling. So here, uh, the problem is that, as uh, Catherine uh, mentioned, uh, uh, I think, a little, well, it was during a conversation before, not during the talk, uh, whatever. Uh, when uh, they harvest shellfishes, they put that on the, on the market, okay? And the Ifromer measure the toxins in the, the meat of shellfish. But the results arrive with three days, sometimes it's five, depending, yeah, it's, uh, and it's too late. The products are already on the supermarkets, and maybe sometimes they are already in your belly, so <laughs> it's not so good. And of course, you can imagine what is happening. It's a product, product recall. The, the shellfish farmers are losing a lot, money, uh, uh, the, uh, their reputation, are, um, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> you understand what I want to say. And with our biosensor, the Lecat's uh, uh, shellfish farmers have really a self-monitoring uh, system. So at day plus one after sampling, we are giving our alert system, and then they can go for action. In Lecat's, they have the chance to have uh, basins where they can move the, the, the shells, the shellfish, when we give the alert, or they can decide for an early harvest if the weight is okay, they can plan also, they sail, etc. So it's very precious for them. And just to show you, then I have also a Christmas illustration. <laughs> it was uh, the monitoring of dinophysis, uh, so the microalgae uh, causing problem for them. It's uh, producing a very strong uh, diarrheic uh, toxin. So we follow uh, this species uh, during uh, eight weeks before Christmas. And uh, so you have in blue, sorry, in, with the blue curve you have the activity, and the bars are showing the toxin measured by the ifromer. So on the first two weeks, you see that after four measurements, we are okay, toxins are okay. And then at the end of the second week, we are already uh, giving a, an alert, orange alert, okay, there's something happening. And then one, two, three, four times, it's, it's continue rising up, and we gave an alert. And the f for the first time, the toxins were also above the thresholds. But you see, it's nine days before the first uh, uh, alert from the informer was given. So it's quite crazy uh, what they gain from that. And it's the same for the rest of, of the, the winter, so the, not the winter, autumn before. Uh, so we stay in a critical situation where we are able to, to see, to detect the decline of the bloom, uh, and really to sign for the really, really hand. Thanks to that, it's a question of money. They really save a lot of money, uh, and they can trigger actions. I can I tell you many, many other stories, even if you are not so old, 
uh, thanks to the kit format, uh, we managed to, to open really new uh, uh, collaborations and we are very excited uh, to continue on that way. So we work with the Luxembourg, with Switzerland, with Croatia. In France, as I say, we, we are in the catalog of Veolia and Suez. Uh, we work in Spain with Eurofins on the Atlantic coast uh, with uh, Ifomer for the a new project this summer, uh, tracking uh, a very dangerous microalgae. Surfrider Foundation also, they, they help us a lot to sample. They are really uh, uh, active because, as Catherine says, surfers are maybe the... Yeah, so they have a big uh, consciousness for that. They are all the year in the water and maybe sometimes for hours, so it's very important for them. And to finish, yeah, we managed also to, to move overseas uh, with a great collaboration uh, in Canada in particular. And last month I was in, invited as a speaker for a very big conference on the topic, so it was really also a big achievement to be there uh, because there the, the problem is quite amazing. And yeah, to finish, to take something home with you, I explain you how you can use these sensors to make high frequency monitoring and to anticipate blooms. But you can also think about other applications. So for example, rapid screening, making possible to, to, to analyze uh, multiple uh, sites at the same time because of this format. Okay, it's not a micro sensor, but the ELISA format enables that to pass a lot of samples in parallel. And this method all together, the sensor and the format, make possible to optimize the chemistry and the microscopy effort, which at the moment is very, very huge in all monitoring programs. It's really too much. And in research also, because detecting an, a parameter like the cellular activity can be very interesting. And to finish, the next steps are yeah, expanding the catalog with other phytoplanktonic groups, but not only because this platform is actually uh, transposable to other microorganisms, like protozoans, bacteria, fungi, yeast, for, for, which, for which we don't have uh, efficient detection methods. We, you can, we can use the same. To have a multiplex format, because for the one we have one kit for each indicator. And then to reduce the cost production, we are still a small lab, a small team, so we, are not, we, are, we don't have a big chain production. And to go to other formats, like, of course, it gave I, want, I would like, love to have something like that with microfluidics, lateral flow, say whatever, to put my biosensor really in the field and uh, to use that directly where it makes problem. And we have also a drawback, let's say it's about the air, RNA extraction, because to start this, we need to extract RNA from water. And at the moment, we are using traditional methods that require chemicals that are not very sympathetic and plastics. And we work also with direct analysis and their cartridge, which permits to, to extract RNA uh, with the physical uh, methods. Yeah, and I think I, I, I use my time. So if you have questions, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Sandra. You're that welcome. Was great. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, step by step, we, we move to a more integrated sensors to deploy on the field everywhere. So now we are going to the panel session, and uh, we will we have a guest, a very special guest for this session. Uh, please, Vincent, come on on stage. So we welcome uh, Vincent Bouchard from Graphil. So we we talked about different technologies. Um, Thomas has made the focus on silicon sensors uh, being developed in uh, CLAT, but uh, there is not only silicon. There is graphene, right, Vincent? So uh, Vincent is the CEO of Graphil, and he's developing sensors based on graphene. So he's going to explain us a little more. W what is the difference between uh, graphene uh, technologies and graphene and uh, silicon technologies? Uh, where do you use those technologies? So please. Uh, we give you yep. a few minutes to yeah, introduce, yeah, and then we will welcome all the speakers on stage. Thank Vincent. you, Eleanor, for that. So, yeah, indeed, um, beyond um, silicon, there are many other uh, possibilities. And so uh, the project I present is coming from Grenoble here. Uh, it started more than 10 years ago. 
Graphene is a monolayer of carbon which can replace silicon. It has some uh, advantage for biosensors I just want to, to show here. So we started from uh, very basic reactors here. Uh, we made this uh, synthesis which started to be uh, mainstream in 2010. And then we went up to producing square meters of graphene at low cost, as you can see on the bottom right picture, which are on polymers, so you can do plastic electronics. And uh, so what we found is that it's a marvelous material to interact with biological elements because it's at the form tree between inorganic uh, world because it's a pure carbon layers, but it's also a kind of a polymer of benzene, so it's uh, very easy to biofunctionalize, to do organic chemistry with it. So as you can see here, we grow uh, skin cells, uh, a lot of uh, neurons, and of course it's also well suitable to other type of biosensors. So we did a lot of uh, medical application, which is not the topic here, but just to mention, we do um, uh, this uh, smart bandage uh, to detect infection, also to detect in saliva the presence of pathogen and biomarkers. So how it works, uh, it's just uh, a sensor like silicon, so it's basically sensing the charge on the surface. So we have to uh, functionalize the surface to make it specific. Uh, for that, we, we graft uh, by chemistry functional group, and when uh, an analyte is coming and bind on the uh, by biochemical uh, recognition, you have a change of charge, which is sensed as a change of uh, current through the device and the change of uh, electrical resistance. So we can measure a lot of uh, things with this technology uh, from ion uh, composition, if you put ion-sensitive membrane on it. If you put aptamers or DNA, you can recognize very specifically and with high sensitivity, hormones, DNA, uh, protein and virus. Uh, we did a COVID test, for example, which is making uh, um, in three minutes instead of 15 an antigen detection, for example. So, uh, I don't want to go into the detail of the application, but uh, you can see on the website uh, uh, detectors for, for wound healing, uh, managing of uh, chronic wounds for the diabetic, we started on that. Uh, we did this COVID test, uh, which was quite a success, especially in the US, that there is no uh, sanitary pass, so we could make a, a, a tamper-proof and secure uh, sanitary pass, which is, by the way, uh, GDPR compatible, so it's protect the uh, uh, individual protection of uh, health uh, data, for example. And so uh, here you can mention what we start to do now uh, on the uh, water analysis, as you can see on, on the bottom right, and for food and uh, water quality analysis. Since we can make that on the tag, on papers, uh, using the smartphone as a reader, we can make a few euro tests, which is well suitable, I think, for, for water analysis. And we can do multiplexing up to 10 different uh, analyses in parallel at the moment, but probably hundreds in very soon. Thanks. Thank you very much. So now I will uh, ask all the speakers to come on stage uh, for uh, a panel session. Um, so I, I would like to ask you uh, some questions already, uh, and maybe then we can take some questions from uh, the audience. Um, so maybe a, case, a question for Catherine, and also for you, Sandra. Um, Today, there are not some, you mentioned that we only know a few percentage of the ocean, uh, <laughs> and this is very small, and uh, there are not so many sensors already on the field. Um, so w what is preventing uh, the deployment of those sensors on the field? Um, is it uh, from the norm? Uh, we need more norm to push us to put more sensors and more uh, really consider monitoring uh, uh, the environment, is it uh, the issue? Well, I would say it depends on the application. Uh, if you want to do some observation, I mean, the limitation will be, uh, how do you say, the cost. Mm -hmm. I mean, to deploy, I mean, the sensor on a buoy or on the platform or, or whatsoever, because it's quite costly. And uh, then after, it's, uh, it's, it's for monitoring. So it's for, I mean, the, the warning system and the alert system. So there is probably also some, uh, because there is a strong uh, legislation and regulation, I mean, in France, made by Europe. And uh, it's difficult to, um, how, how do you say, to change, I mean, uh, the new, uh, the new, I mean, to, to put new method in this system of this network. And uh, so we have to prove and to validate a lot 
that your new methods, I mean, it's, um, it's more powerful than the golden, I mean, and the, and the, the golden method that it's used. And, uh, and this is, I mean, I think this is the strongest, uh, I mean, challenge. challenge. And uh, then after, in fact, you have also to, uh, uh, to change, how do you say, the way of thinking and the change to mentality and to train people to the new techniques because also it's, uh, I mean, when, when you have a technician uh, who is used to observe, you know, I mean, uh, plankton under the microscope, when you say, okay, now you will do uh, a PCR or you will do, I mean, you will use uh, the biosensor, and they say, hey, this is not my job, I cannot do that. And I so this... You think about the microscopist, uh, which is very often a, a taxonomist, taxonomist expert, uh, it's more like we don't want that he, he loses his job. Uh, because, for example, with my biosensor, you don't need a, a, Q, a QPCR or nothing. It's just a direct measurement. Any technician in a water quality lab can do that. So I, I'm not sure it's about the expertise. Uh, it's about the expertise, but you really have to, uh, I mean, to train them, but to change in the same time the way to, I mean, to yeah, monitor the things. It's a I mean, just to open them up. Uh, shift, yeah. actually. Uh, to it's, we do like this for years. We feel, you know, uh, a form. Okay, I made this. I'm, I made my job. It's done. This mm -hmm. sample was analyzed. It's okay. Let's go back to something else because it's not only about cyanobacteria and all the. There are so many, many things to to check in in the water for the quality. So that, that's, Catherine is right, we, it's hard to make uh, things change. And the new technologies are not always very welcome. We see that as an additional effort, an additional cost, which yeah. in, at the end not the case, but you need to prove that mm -hmm. all the time. So it's a question of how to, to monitor this change, manage, of, uh, manage the change mm -hmm. in the mind of people. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we are human beings quite conservative yeah. and yeah. okay. Thomas, you want to add something? Please, yes, do, but do but take but a mic. But, uh, I, I want to be a bit more positive. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Catherine. <laughs> because, well, in the past, I mean, we succeed to change, for example, so, some assay for the toxin, because we talk, I mean, uh, uh, previously, I mean, to, together about the mouse assay, because it was a standard. And uh, then, but with the help also of the of the professional, I mean, the, the shellfish farmers. So we succeed to move from the mouse bioassay to the chemical assay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I mean, the European Union support, I mean, this, uh, this idea. So, so we, I mean, it's possible. Mm. It's, yeah, possible. it's very yeah. positive. We have support from European Union to push uh, in the right direction. Okay. Yeah, the case yeah. in Europe is not the, in it's no. not the same in not other everywhere. part of the world. Yeah, you're mm. right. Before I, before I heard that story, so that's why I asked Catherine to tell that story, because I thought that yeah, the European Union will never change, or it take 15 years and like 100 lobbyists in Brussels to make stuff change. And so I thought that the world of biosensing on field was separated between what the norm asks and that people will have to do. So for that, they are willing to pay for very expensive equipment because they have to do it. And with what they don't have to do but that they should be doing in order to anticipate what the norm is going to ask them, which is what we call autocontrol. Mm -hmm. And so autocontrol doesn't require a norm because you can perform a control before to have some, some more information. But now I'm very happy to see that with, when you take into account the economic actor and you team with them, you can actually make the yeah. norm evolve. That's very promising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of efforts. <laughs> <laughs> but it did work in your case. It, it works, I mean, but it's four years of... Uh, yeah, of explaining, yeah. And, explaining uh, yeah, yeah. and being clear on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it works. But it works. So, yeah. Let's and and so when, when it comes to auto control, well, the rig, the, 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 you, do, you need very different sensor than the one you will need if you are trying to enforce the norm because auto control is only being supported by the user themselves. So in that framework, the price of each sensor and whether it's a disposable sensor or not disposable sensor that you have to, and the, oh, the way you're going to removing the liter cost for the sensor, just like you say, is very important. So this is why I, the technology that is proposed, for example, by Graphil, can make disposable sensor. Can, can, it, can it? Like 
Absolutely, well, yeah, we're not trying to make it on paper, so the ecological impact, the footprint is very minimum. Mm. You, you, you told me before, uh, Vincent, when we were discussing about the, the differences between silicon and graphene, uh, the huge difference is that you can do it uh, without any clean room. Yeah, uh, so yeah absolutely. The, of course, for it you depends to, on the size yeah. of the sensor, but mm -hmm. uh, we don't need super small size, so mm -hmm. we do that with ele printed electronics, mm -hmm. uh, ink, uh, print, inkjet printing, and so it's uh, on all to all basis. Mm -hmm. so production can be very, mean, okay. very cheap. I have many other questions, but maybe I will ask uh, the audience if uh, there is questions. There are questions. No, so I, I will move on with mine. Okay. <laughs> so I had another question about um, state organizations, and you, you talked about it uh, a bit, Catherine. Um, so the water agencies are relying on methods stated by the norm, and today, they don't ask for fast measurement, as you propose. Um, not oh, always. No, they are asking. Sometimes. But no, no, they are asking for methods. But it's all the, how to say, the multi-layer uh, organization of institution around water, because water uh, touch a lot of different categories of things. That's critical. That's difficult. But water agencies are demanding on new way of yeah, improving mm -hmm. things or so. That's mm -hmm. not a problem. But the norms are not yet the there. Yeah, but for example, uh, at Microbial Environment, we are working on normalization of our methods. Okay. It's a voluntary uh, no norms, uh, something we do with uh, AFNOR. Mm -hmm. It's a way of okay. penetrating uh, the market at the end and to propose our, our technology because with a certification, you are more uh, reliable, people can trust you more easily than if you are just a small team of... Uh, uh, in a laboratory in the very south of France. <laughs> That's so it. basically, there wasn't a norm, and you guys created a norm yeah, you have that a you way proposed, you and you were you lucky enough way, that they yeah. accepted that norm, and now it's become the gold standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, more or less. It's a way. It's and the so first <laughs> way of penetrating the norms and the regulation. It's to, to act as a, as a voluntary uh, action. Okay. You make your, your harm norm. But it's, you're not alone. You are uh, supported by. Uh, uh, who, who is supporting you? The AFNOR. We pay the for AFNOR, that. Okay. We pay to achieve to have a, a, a voluntary uh, norm. Mm -hmm. okay. And I w just want to add that because we were talking before that comment that when you try to sell the kit to shell farmers, they are they buy difficultly because they cannot. Uh, estimate how much money is going to make them save or gain? Yeah, and it's even more complex because we don't sell the kits to the shellfish farmers. We sell the kit to a lab, which is able to perform the analysis for the, the shellfish farmers. So the shellfish farmers are the buyers of the technology, but the, they are not using directly mm. the technology. Okay. Yeah. That's something of okay, we can think with a microsensor a system like you propose, mm -hmm. something that you can put in the hands of the end user, but mm -hmm. we are not here. Mm -hmm. But this is your dream, right? Yeah, it's At already a good achievement because mm -hmm. with the ELISA kit format, we can, uh, it makes possible to other water quality lab to use our technology, even if they are not molecular biologists or whatever. They mm -hmm. have, it's just a set of reagents to make a colorimetric reaction. Mm -hmm. So and actually, I propose, because I'm not involved in neither of those companies, that if you take the better from microbia and graphene, graphene, you see, can make pass for COVID that give you a QR code that you can track with your entire stay, and that will have embedded the result of the test in a secured way. Well, if you had both of both worlds, you give that to a shellfish farmer, he tests his shellfish, and he puts the QR code into the... Casing yeah. of the shellfish, and when it lands on your table, you can check directly that is. And so we all spend a, a, a good Christmas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay. Perfect. Would sure <laughs> <we'll> be <laughs> ideal. <laughs> Great. I, I have a question for you, Vincent, because Graphil, your um, mainstream product is for healthcare, and now you are moving to other markets, uh, among which water monitoring. Is it a, a valuable market for you? 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, the um, healthcare is the most difficult one. Uh, we started with that because uh, at, when we started, the uh, graphene was still an expensive material. So we needed the margin to really show that the business model was worthy. Uh, now that uh, graphene is getting a cheaper commodity and we can produce it by a square meter, uh, it makes you know this kind of traceability and water quality uh, more um, affordable. So we are targeting that in terms of volume. It's easier, and uh, of course, it's easier to uh, regulation and uh, market access is mm. faster. And are you saying so biodegradable? Yeah, we can make it. Uh, at the moment, it's a plastic layer, so it's not fully... The, but you could uh, transfer to, pa to paper? To paper, or? yes. We are working on that. Yeah. Because the liter of the sensor is actually... Uh, one and something I would like is that there is no battery. Uh, battery is the 80% of the uh, pollution uh, for uh, small uh, field uh, sensors. Oh, okay. The fact that we power it with a smartphone is a uh, uh, key point. Huh? Is that there is only the, the yeah, graphene. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's passive support. Mm. Yes. And, and so it answers your needs to, to clean the ocean, not let dirty technologies. Yes, uh, yes but I have, to, uh, I have to admit that uh, I mean, uh, I'm the, in the oceanography uh, I mean, uh, uh, researcher, I mean, uh, I mean, didn't think about I mean uh, the pollution. I mean, the, the made by the observation because there is a lot of equipment, you know, I mean, on the, on the sea floor. And uh, now, in fact, we, um, I mean, for, for the equipment and for, for the sensor, so we, we think about the eco-conception and even for the, for the plastic, for example, so we have some project, I mean, for, to use some uh, biodegradable and uh, bio, I mean, bio-sourced bio -source, uh, plastic. But it's not so easy to degrade. I mean, plastic. I mean, in the sea because it's not the same temperatures and on Earth. So, but it's a it's a challenge. Maybe we have to use some other materials and plastics. I have a tough question. I'm not sure one of you can answer. But do you have an idea of the volume of sensors uh, that will be needed in the next ten years for water monitoring? Well, I would say the most as possible, but the difficulty, I mean, uh, in our research uh, and development units, we have some difficulties, I mean, to transfer our technology to companies because it's a kind of small market and we call this niche market. And so we are not so attractive. So when we talk about, uh, how do you say, water quality, I mean, there is a huge market, I mean, for fresh water. I mean, uh, yeah, maybe. for freshwater sector, but for marine uh, areas, so it's another story. So, so yeah, freshwater, uh, you can feel yeah, sure. it's very different. Particularly the water supply chain, uh, mm. for sure. Uh, it's big players in the field. Mm. And, we and don't they are open for mm. technologies, and they really su support, uh, absorb even <laughs> technologies, because, yeah. And, and angry. You were telling me uh, before the, the session that uh, the story of this um, Canadian, Canadian city uh, mm. where water was shut down for two weeks because uh, of... Yeah, uh, because of a cyan yeah, 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 in Toledo. Uh, so it's in uh, Ohio at the border with Canada, still US, but it's at the border. It's uh, yeah, 500,000 people who receive uh, mineral waters in bottles for two weeks. And uh, it's a one of the is Lac Erie, Lac Erie, uh, one of mm. the Great mm. Lakes was completely green. Mm. The entire lake was completely green. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's hope we, we find solutions to monitor know, before it happens here. It's a very good here. point you, you're bringing because it's what Catherine says is very true that the system we're building are very complex, but we don't know if they are going to be sold as much as cell phone, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is a, um, a need to change the economic model of transfer of those sensors. For example, at the beginning of the project I was presenting, I was thinking if I had to get a startup that I would just sell the system, right? But now I realize that what is better is have a few systems for yourself and sell the service because you're going to sell the service much more often than the chip itself, right? But so it, you have to redefine the chain of value around mm -hmm. each of those, uh, those technologies based on where they're going to be used. Okay, that's clear. Thank you.
Um, I have a last question. Um, let's say we, we meet again in 10 years. Oh, I hope we will not uh, wait 10 years, but um, we meet again in 10 years. We welcome you to the Late Innovation Days in 10 years, yeah, because they will still be here. Um, and um, we let me ask you, what will be the dream title of your presentation? What do you hope uh, we, uh, could be the dream title of your presentation in 10 years? Ah, tough question. <laughs> Vincent? I think, maybe I think the, the real value behind that is the data, it's not the, the tool, huh? it's the really what you can get from it. And uh, So I think the, the, the main point here is to have a data acquisition which is valuable in time mm -hmm. and position. And I think this kind of tool, when multiplex and make it uh, more affordable and available, it's uh, about this, uh, making this data available. And for combining data of the water quality with uh, food traceability, which I think is going to be the a way to make it economically uh, viable. So, yeah. Okay. So your talk would be about the data. Yes. How much information you can yeah, get yeah. from the data. Multiplexing data, data because mm. we can make hundreds of measurements mm. on the same device at the end. Perfect. Thank you. Well, I have, I have two. I would like to, <laughs> yeah, I like to hear both of them uh, <laughs> explaining how they uh, control shellfish and they identify that control by a QR code. But for myself, I say I would like to present um, not a drone, but a permanent buoy that will be at sea and that will constantly send data, not need to be maintained, and that I have, it, it would mean that I have overcome biofooling. <laughs> Oh, you, you were asking what the dream yeah, would dream be, right? Yeah. This, is, this is a Feel dream. Free. <laughs> <laughs> Let's dream together. <laughs> Sandra? Because, yeah. ju ju just, I mean, uh, okay. I mean uh, ju just to, uh, to tell you that, for example, the, uh, uh, for our uh, fixed uh, platform for the boys, so usually we do uh, a maintenance every two months. Uh, two months is quite a long time. Oh, it's not. I mean, for example, for the, uh, uh, how do we call the EMR? I mean, the, um, the, uh, the new, um, you know, for the offshore, you know, uh, yeah, the, uh, wind, uh, wind in energy yeah. offshore. Wind wind. So they want, I mean, uh, to have a maintenance every five, five or ten years. Yes, okay. 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 Well, <laughs> oh, this is a challenge. Yeah. This There's is a challenge, gaps, Thomas. Yeah. Yeah, because taken? if I put my, my system in water now, I have to do maintenance every two hours, right? <laughs> so, so yeah. We can see the progress that needs to be made. Yeah. <laughs> Job to but, do. <laughs> but I have to say, we have solution. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah exactly. I, I, we have solution for sensors. Another yeah, reason yeah. why we should team up. Yeah. <laughs> Sandra? Um, me, dream my title? dream title would be uh, Biosensors and Participative Science, because mm. I will dream that... Maybe in 10 years it's short, but 20, let's say, let's hope that people, uh, citizens, children, I don't know, association, people involved everywhere can with water learn. can participate and collect samples for the, this great technology we have in hand or to fight for these biofouling things, maintaining your equipment because they are there, they are living close to the beach, they are living uh, close to the river. They can really help the scientific community to put all this data together, to have as much data as possible. And then everybody, when, it's, when people are involved, they are much more interested also, because they took the sample or then cleaned the, uh, the, the boat. They want to know uh, mm. what is the result, what is about, yeah. what's going to be. In a, I think that's the future of monitoring, to involve people, citizens, communities, to the scientific mm. role. Participative science. Mm -hmm. this, uh, I, I love it. I love it. Well, I, 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 can, I cannot I imagine from yeah, me. <laughs> if you can uh, follow from your smartphone uh, yeah. air quality around you, uh, presence uh, of uh, bacteria in the water, and so on. I guess everybody would be watching his phone very often and checking, mm -hmm. oh, okay, there is a problem occurring. We should do something yeah. <laughs> and feeling more concerned. Yeah, this is, I, I like it. I like it very much. Well, I have uh, maybe more uh, basic, uh, basic dreams. So, uh, what we really need, in fact, is to have a kind of uh, uh, multidisciplinary uh, observatory, uh, because one, I mean, the black box uh, we have to say is to uh, to estimate the biodiversity in real time and to understand the functioning, 
And uh, me, I mean, if we can, uh, I mean, succeed to analyze the EDNA, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, under, the, under the water, so that will be uh, very good. But I think in 10 years, I mean, I'm sure the CEA can do that. Oh, thank you, Catherine. <laughs> so th those will be the last words. Thank you very much. I like it. <laughs> so thank you very much for being with us this year. And uh, this is the end of the session. This is the end of the Late Innovation Days. We, we hope that you enjoyed it. You made good connections. And we, we will, uh, will be delighted to see you again next year. So thank you. <laughs>